I have a bit of a confession to make. I am a sucker for any article that compares the modern pandemic to the Spanish flu. I mean, there's something so deeply human about learning how people a hundred years ago dealt with the same challenges that we're dealing with today, even though they had a totally different understanding of medicine. But there's one comparison I was always curious about. Vaccine development. By 1918, scientists already had a good track record with vaccines like the ones for smallpox, diphtheria, and even the plague. So an influenza vaccine would have been within reach back then, but it never panned out. So I had to know why. And as I read more, it turned out that multiple universities, labs, and even private doctors tried making their own vaccines, but none of them worked. And it was a story of scientific hubris, ethics, and how a little bit of misinformation can have far-reaching consequences. Let's set the scene. If you rewind back to the end of the 19th century, medical science was finally starting to work for the first time. Everything from hygiene to microscopes to x-rays were popping up around then, but one of the most important changes was a general acceptance of germ theory, the idea that specific germs cause specific diseases. We finally understood that infectious diseases weren't caused by the wrath of the gods or poisonous air or social taboos. They were caused by germs like viruses or bacteria. And a few scientists figured out that you could identify which germ caused which disease by using a kind of checklist called Koch's postulates. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you're a scientist in the 1800s and you notice that this little guy tends to show up in people with tuberculosis. To figure out whether it actually causes the disease, you'd keep looking at people, or more ethically, rats and guinea pigs, with tuberculosis and notice that you keep finding the bacteria. So next, you'd have to isolate that germ and reproduce it, or culture it, in a lab. Then if you put those germs into a healthy host, the host would need to get tuberculosis, since that's the disease of interest. Then, if you could find that original germ in this new sick host, you'd identify the germ that causes tuberculosis. Copy and paste for whatever disease you like. That's how Robert Koch found the causative germ of tuberculosis in 1882, and it's why this checklist became known as Koch's postulates. Fast forward to 1889, and the world was dealing with a wicked bad influenza pandemic. It killed about a million people back when the world's population was only about one and a half billion. So naturally, scientists started putting a little more effort into figuring out the flu. And the first step was using Koch's postulates to find the cause of the disease. In 1892, a German bacteriologist named Richard Pfeiffer published a paper claiming that he had found the culprit. He took samples from people with the flu and found these little rod-shaped bacteria in every single one of them. He called it Bacillus influenzae, although a lot of people just called it Pfeiffer's Bacillus after him. But he made a big mistake. In his paper, which I had to use Google Translate to read, Pfeiffer explained that these bacteria were hard to work with. It would only grow in specific media, which is the stuff that you put into the dish. So Pfeiffer did find the bacteria in flu victims, which fulfills postulate one. And even though it was tricky, he was able to culture those bacteria, fulfilling postulate it too. But here's the big deal. He couldn't get them to cause the flu by themselves. So ultimately, the germ failed to meet Koch's postulates. Now, even though Pfeiffer didn't have great evidence that his thing caused the flu, he published his research anyway because he found the germ so frequently and in such enormous numbers in flu victims. If it wasn't the cause, it was at least the best candidate. And very few people in the scientific community pushed back against the findings. At that point, bacteriologists had established that diseases like cholera or the plague were caused by bacteria, so Pfeiffer's claims were plausible. Plus, he had a great reputation. Here he is working with Robert Koch, the rock star of germ theory himself. But over the next 25 years, scientists kept testing Pfeiffer's findings and got mixed results. Lots of microbiologists found Pfeiffer's bacillus in flu victims, which confirmed his findings, but others found the bacillus in totally healthy people, and some found it in completely different diseases altogether. And to make things worse, in order to see it under a microscope, you had to use this blue stain that made it easy to confuse with diplococci, a different type of bacteria. So by the early 20th century, we were starting to get evidence that Pfeiffer's bacillus was maybe like a secondary invader during the flu, or at least that influenza was a more complex pathology than we thought. In 1912, William Osler gave us a snapshot of that uncertainty when he described the disease in his medical textbook. Under influenza, he just says that a special organism, bacillus influenzae, is found. Not the cause, just is found. So in the years leading up to the pandemic of 1918, bacillus influenzae was our best candidate for the cause of the flu. But before talking about biology anymore, we need to talk about the military. It's 1917, America enters World War I. 
The army grows from around 200,000 to 1.5 million troops, and in order to train them, they'd be stationed at army camps the size of small cities. One day, the head of the army medical team, William Gorgeous, looked at this big new army and realizes that the US is grossly underprepared for an epidemic. They had thousands of young men training in close quarters at these new camps. They were understaffed, undertrained, and undersupplied. So in 1917, he gets the government to stockpile some existing vaccines, convert old train cars to mobile laboratories, and put together a special unit for the prevention of infectious diseases. And it was perfect timing, because in the winter of 1917 to 1918, U.S. Army camps saw multiple measles outbreaks. This was decades before the measles vaccine, so all in all, 90,000 troops were infected and between three and 4,000 died. But there was a bit of a silver lining. The measles epidemic would teach scientists one of the most important lessons about infections. Army doctors routinely performed autopsies on the deceased soldiers, and when they did, they'd find all kinds of bacteria inside the soldiers' lungs. These bacteria were causing pus to accumulate both inside and outside of the lung cavity, often causing potentially lethal sepsis, or it might have crept around the heart, causing inflammation of the heart cavity. These autopsies also pointed to damaged bronchioles, the tubes that pass air from the main bronchi into each lungs. And sometimes the soldiers' lungs would fill with fluid, starving other tissues of oxygen and killing them that way. It was a real nasty way to die. It was clear from these autopsies that the soldiers were dying from pneumonia, an infection of the lungs that can inflame the air sacs and get them to fill with fluid. Pneumonia infection can come from bacteria, viruses, or fungi that are spread through respiratory droplets, but bacterial pneumonia can also be triggered by viral infections. These soldiers had what's called a secondary bacterial pneumonia. The measles virus was the primary infection, bacteria was the second. And this type of pneumonia ended up being way deadlier than straight up viral pneumonia. After all of those autopsies, scientists at the Rockefeller Institute in New York identified three specific pneumococci, or bacteria usually present in pneumonia patients. They managed to come up with some treatments that worked against these bacteria in mice models, but mice aren't people, so the treatments didn't work in human patients. And this was before antibiotics, so the best treatments we had at the time were things like digitalis or epinephrine that might prevent the cardiac failure associated with pneumonia, or sometimes they'd give morphine for pain, and sometimes they'd surgically cut into the lung cavity. Like I said, this was a real nasty disease with some equally nasty treatments. So a quick summary. By the beginning of 1918, we had hundreds of thousands of soldiers sharing cramped army camps. We knew that secondary pneumonia was deadly, but at least we had an idea of what to expect. And we erroneously thought we knew what caused the flu. What could go wrong? In January of 1918, a doctor out in Haskell County, Kansas, noticed that more and more of his patients were presenting with a violent form of influenza. He treated them as best he could and eventually asked the U.S. Public Health Service for help, but they were a little busy dealing with the war. Luckily for Haskell County, the weird cases subsided by the end of the month. But the doctor was concerned enough to write a report to Public Health Reports, which was printed in April 1918. According to the CDC, this little paragraph was the first report of this strange new influenza anywhere in the world. Some modern epidemiologists disagree and think the first outbreak was somewhere else, but nobody knows for sure. Fast forward to September of 1918, and the deadliest wave of the pandemic, the second wave, is ramping up. And as scientists did autopsies on the dead, they noticed the same thing that army physicians noticed during the measles epidemic a few months earlier. Most of the young people who died these violent deaths had gross, pus-filled lungs. The influenza didn't kill them, Bacterial pneumonia killed them. Now, since the wisdom of the day said that Pfeiffer's bacillus caused the flu, researchers immediately started looking for that germ in influenza patients. If they could isolate the bacillus, they could develop an antiserum or a vaccine against it and save more lives. And doctors actually did find Pfeiffer's bacillus in some of the victims' bodies, but not all of them. And just like Pfeiffer in 1893, scientists had a hard time isolating and culturing the bacteria in the lab, so they kept pursuing it, hoping their grind would pay off in the end. But naturally, loads of scientists started questioning the assumed premise. Are we sure that this is the germ that causes the flu? Scientists at the time knew there were germs smaller than bacteria, but they couldn't see them with the microscopes of the day. They'd find them by taking a heap of bacteria, passing it through a superfine filter like the Pasteur Chamberlain filter seen here, and culturing whatever passed through the filter. They called that newly isolated germ a filter passable germ, or what we now call a virus. And researchers at the Rockefeller Institute, Peter Olitsky and Frederick Gates, 
went looking for one. They took snot samples from patients infected with pandemic influenza, filtered out the bacteria, and put that new germ into rabbits. The filter passable germ made the rabbit sick, which suggested that influenza wasn't caused by a bacteria after all. It was caused by this filter passable virus. But other scientists couldn't replicate their results, so the Pfeiffer's bacillus hypothesis lived another day. Those two also got pushback from another Rockefeller researcher named Oswald Avery, who had developed a new media called chocolate agar, which finally made Pfeiffer's bacillus easier to culture. So while we knew that Pfeiffer's bacillus was flawed, the idea that flu was caused by a virus virus wasn't generally accepted yet. But whatever caused influenza, it was clear to scientists in 1918 that pneumonia secondary to influenza was the killer. So if they were going to vaccinate against anything, they'd have to focus on those bacteria. Back then, you had a few options for a vaccine. Assuming you actually identified the correct causative germ, you could keep culturing it, hoping that a chance mutation would make a strain of the germ less dangerous, like the tuberculosis vaccine, or you could kill the germ with heat. At the end of the day, your goal was to produce a version of the germ that would teach your immune system how to destroy the pathogen if it ever came across the germ in the wild. This is where this story gets chaotic. By October 2nd, 1918, New York City's health commissioner announced that the head bacteriologist at the city health department, William Park, was working on a vaccine against Pfeiffer's bacillus. He'd taken the bacteria from sick patients, blasted it with heat, and gave it to volunteers from the health department staff. They get three doses, given two days apart from each other. And based on this small sample, Park was hopeful that he'd be able to put out a vaccine before the end of the year. And by November, he had rolled out 39,000 doses of his vaccine, most of which were actually taken. But remember, he was vaccinating against a single bacteria and one that didn't actually cause the flu. So on December 13th, 1918, the health commissioner told the New York Times that their vaccine had no effect on influenza prevention. But they were far from the only ones cooking up vaccines. Faculty at the University of Pittsburgh came up with their own vaccine using 13 strains of heat-treated Pfeiffer's bacillus. In a single week, they went from lab bench to animal testing to human testing to distribution for use in humans. It's like the university anticipated how fast COVID vaccines would be developed and said, hold my beer. Meanwhile, scientists at Tulane University in New Orleans were making their own vaccine using a chemically killed Pfeiffer's bacillus, and some private doctors were making their own vaccines, most of which were designed for this one incorrect bacteria. In total, hundreds of thousands of doses of these vaccines were made. But not every vaccine focused on Pfeiffer's bacillus. The majority used a combination of bacteria found in the secondary pneumonia infections, things like pneumococci and streptococci. The most promising and widely used vaccine was a mixed bacterial vaccine made by the scientists at the Mayo Foundation led by Edward C. Rosenau. They believed that a flu vaccine should have the same composition as whatever germs were going around, which meant the vaccine had to be adjusted often. And that was way ahead of its time. It's pretty similar to what we do for today's seasonal flu shot. The initial recipe was a mix of mostly pneumococci, streptococci, and staphylococci bacteria, and a little bit of Pfeiffer's, although they'd eventually drop Pfeiffer entirely. The Chicago Health Department took that recipe and made half a million doses of the vaccine and distributed them across the city and eventually the rest of the state. But despite the success in the lab, early reports indicated that none of these vaccines were effective at preventing influenza. After a few months of this, in January of 1919, the editorial committee over at the American Journal of Public Health released an article detailing the best practices for dealing with the flu. They recognized that none of the available vaccines prevented influenza, but they wondered if they did anything against secondary pneumonias. They also introduced the article with this kind of passive-aggressive parable of Noah and the Ark and how he should have set up a control arc. I'll link it down in the description if you want to read it. I think they were calling out scientists for working too fast and not using control groups in their vaccine trials, though. Either way, shortly after that was published, the worst of the pandemic would be over in the United States, and it would slowly taper off throughout the rest of the world. Clearly, none of these vaccines prevented primary infection from the influenza virus, but did any of them make a difference for secondary infections that were caused by bacteria? Probably not. The 1918 scientists were working off the premise that if they threw a bunch of different bacteria into their vaccines, they'd immunize against all the germs that could infect someone after primary infection. What they didn't know is that those pneumococcal bacteria come in multiple serotypes, basically the same species of bacteria, but with different markers on their surfaces. 
that means our bodies wouldn't necessarily have immunity to all serotypes if we were only vaccinated against one. In the end, the vaccines against the influenza pandemic failed, but the whole experience highlighted one of our biggest weaknesses. We didn't know what caused the flu after all. So in the following years, researchers were laser focused on influenza research. Luckily, there wouldn't be another influenza pandemic in humans for a few decades. But in 1918, and again in 1929, Farmers in Iowa reported outbreaks of a flu-like illness in their pigs. So a researcher from the Rockefeller Institute took a bunch of lung samples from the pigs and found a bacteria that looked just like Pfeiffer's bacillus. But when he cultured it and injected it into pigs, it didn't make them sick. This particular germ failed to meet Koch's postulates. So he passed the samples through a filter, cultured that, and found that this new filtrate was able to make the pigs sick. Then he mixed the filtrate and bacteria and found that it caused an even more severe version of the disease. He concluded that the filter passable germ, the virus, caused the primary infection and the bacteria caused a secondary infection, which is what made influenza so deadly for pigs. His report was published in 1930. Then different researchers showed the same phenomenon in humans in 1933, making it clear that a virus caused influenza. After the millions of influenza deaths during the pandemic, we finally figured out how the flu worked. Obviously, it would have been great to figure that out before the pandemic, but even in an alternate reality where we correctly spotted the cause of influenza and developed a vaccine against it, our medical distribution infrastructure likely wouldn't have been fast enough to respond to the outbreaks. So, what's the takeaway from this whole story then? 1918 was one of the greatest inflection points for modern medicine. The lessons learned from that pandemic got us to throw out the old textbooks and reevaluate everything we thought we knew about influenza. And we have the failure of 1918's vaccination efforts to thank for the efficiency, safety, and effectiveness of not only influenza vaccines today, but vaccine trials in general. There would be no more testing spur-of-the-moment concoctions in your basement. You'd need control groups and extensive trials before vaccine approval. So, while there are a lot of similarities between 1918 and the modern pandemic, vaccine development isn't one of them. One thing that hasn't really changed, though, is the non-pharmaceutical strategy. Things like quarantines, masks, and hand washing. And one little town made it through the 1918 pandemic without a single death from influenza thanks to those strategies alone. I made a video all about it, which you can watch right here. Before you go, though, hit the like button so that YouTube shows this video to more people, and consider subscribing if you want more medical history videos. Have fun, be good. Thanks for watching.